Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, we're hearing an awful lot at the moment about the threat to free speech on our university campuses. The very places, in fact, which should be open to free thought and new ideas. But there are signs of a fight back. With me today is James Oliver. He's a PhD student at the University of Buckingham. And last year, he started a free speech society there. Uh, welcome, James. Good to, to meet you. Uh, why did you start the society? Well, I suppose there's more than one reason. But mm. the main catalyst, I would have to say, was uh, early last year when the journalist and author Peter Hitchens found himself deplatformed, disinvited, whatever you want to call it, from yeah. the University of Portsmouth. Yeah. And... I've been a, a long time fan of his work um, and I've admired his stance on free speech uh, all the way through that as well. And I just felt like it was maybe somewhat symbolic, wouldn't want to elevate it too much, but that somebody who's been so outspoken and so committed to yes. free expression, yeah. uh, free thought, that he found himself in, in this position. Why do, what was the reason given? Because I think a lot of people watching won't quite know what happened. There. With Peter? Well, yeah. Uh, as far as I could tell, there was some concern on the part of the Students' Union that views that he has uttered in the past about transgenderism, I, th I think this is right, um, yeah. were, had the potential to make some people upset. Um, and I think it may well have coincided with some sort of anniversary in L L LGBT anniversary yeah. um, of some kind. Uh, but the strange thing was it, it was as far as i remember not, not what he was there to speak on no. this was a, a tangential thing um or essentially unrelated and they basically said you can't come at this time um and i believe when there was a backlash in the media they tried to try to backtrack quickly and suggested that he could come at a, a later date but of course at that point uh peter hitchens would, was done with them um he's not He's not interested in that. No, no, exactly. being, being yeah. cowed. But who are who are they, as it were? I mean, who were the people who complained? Who who managed to get it stopped? I don't know how many students yeah. were 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 bothered by mm. his uh, potential appearance, but I'm pretty sure that the people who had the kind of final say were the students' union. Mm. Um, I don't know a, a ton about that specific case, mm. uh, but I just when it when it hit the when it hit the papers, I just found it to be. Uh, just really rather sad, um, mm. um, somewhat infuriating, but really just a bit depressing. Um, and I happened to discuss this with a friend of mine from the university who's the co-founder of the society, Daria uh, Ermolenko. Yeah. And we were, just, we were just talking about it. She, she's a fan of his work as well. And later that night I said, well, why don't we start a society that could have Mr. Hitchens come and speak and in a sense try to right the wrong yeah. of Portsmouth. And then, then we came up with the idea that we could seek to invite more people who'd been disinvited. And that's when we came up with this slogan that we would re-platform the de-platformed. Re-platform the de-platformed, yeah, this that, is your logo. That's kind of our mission. It's not right. the only thing we're concerned with. We're happy to invite anybody who has mm. interesting ideas uh, surrounding free speech. Well, to be honest, uh, interesting ideas of any kind. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly a big component of, of uh, sort of our mission statement, I suppose, that we want to try to give those people, of which there are many now, who found themselves in trouble at other, other universities, a, 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 a home, if you like. Has he been up so far? Oh, he, yeah. He, he came um, up, so, what so was it like? He, he was our inaugural speaker. Oh, right. And that was wonderful. Uh, he was fantastic. Um, he came to speak on the as he refers to it, the so-called war on drugs. Right. Uh, had a really lively discussion, um, some heated debate from the audience because it's quite a hot topic. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was fantastic to have him. Um, and he did it all completely free of charge as well. He wouldn't even take travel expenses. Really? So just, oh. just shows the character of the man. Mm. Um, it, was, it was wonderful to have him. I'd, I'd gladly have him back any time. Well, we had him on this show Yes, last I know, I know. year, yeah. um, and uh, you know, it's one of our most popular shows. People seem yeah. to seem to love him. Um, one thing is that with 
your particular society is it it's at the University of Buckingham where you are mm. uh, you know I think a lot of people maybe might not know but the University of Buckingham's got a particular kind of niche hasn't it it, mm-hmm. it is the only private university still in, in Britain isn't it I've I'm not 100% sure if it's the only one but it's certainly the first one right um, the very first one. I think other people have maybe tried uh, in the I, I'm not 100% but um, but, but it's, it's it's not actually a university that would necessarily seem to have a problem with free speech isn't that right well in a sense there's a, there's a bit of an irony here in that uh, we've set up a free speech society and arguably uh, the place with the with the fewest problems with free speech basically no issue with free speech we we've found ourselves we've never had any bannings um, as far as I am aware and when the free speech university rankings existed for about four or five years Buckingham was consistently at the very top of right. the pile right. uh, they were set up by uh, Tom Slater and Brendan O'Neill over at Spiked Online and we we qualified for what they they had a traffic light ranking system uh, green, amber, red, and we got green lights every year that they existed. And what that, m- what you had to achieve in order to receive a green light award was no uh, suppression of free speech whatsoever. Right. And just as a kind of, just a marker for how bad it's got in this country. In the final year of the rankings, there were only there was only one university in England, I believe, that that met the criteria for a green light. And also a university in Wales, I think. Really? So there were, as, yeah, as far as I know. How many are we talking, actually? Hundreds. Hundreds now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's extraordinary. Um, what, other, what other instances can you describe to us that you know about at other universities? You mentioned Peter Hitchens at Portsmouth, mm. right? But, you know, we hear about deplatforming. There are a, there are a number of big cases, aren't there? I mean, I'm thinking of Julie Bindle, for example, yep. Jermaine Greer. I mean, can you tell it's us Claire what happened Fox as those, well. What happened with Claire Fox? Um, the specifics, again, I'm somewhat hazy on, but she was going to speak, I think, at a university in Manchester. Mm. Um, and she was eventually told she couldn't, she couldn't come and act. I wouldn't want to misspeak, but I think this was something to do with her, again, ironically, her prior defense of free speech in public. And she's, she's fallen into some hot water f- for, for mm-hmm. her real strong commitment, essentially, to an absolutist mm-hmm. view, uh, she, she would say, mm-hmm. um, or very close to. Yeah. Depends how you want to define absolutism. But she, uh, she I think, was going to be a guest of the Free Speech Society there. I, I'm not, really? again, not 100%, but, mm. but th- I've certainly seen that in other cases where free speech societies have been set up and then haven't actually been able to kind of follow no, through. Or, I think more often, students' unions will just simply not approve the founding of a free speech society. And that's one of the things that was fantastic about setting up at Buckingham. We, we came up with the idea and really very swiftly did all the paperwork and we were approved with pretty much no resistance. Obviously, we had to go through the usual checks that any society would have to go through but there were, there were no problems for us mm. and we found incredibly strong backing from the SU all the way through we've had uh, the presidents of we've gone through two presidents now um, at the SU two, two terms mm. and both of them have attended our events uh, and we've also Daria my co-founder she's uh, the vice president of the SU and we essentially buck the trend where at other universities you find the SUs to be the the least forgiving on any of this, and we seem to have the opposite experience. Uh, Student unions are really quite powerful now, aren't they? I think they're more powerful than in my day. Possibly. Which was like 40 years ago at university. Yeah, I think they've always been very politically minded. Mm. I guess it, it's student politics, isn't mm. it? So the sorts of people that you are likely to get committing to those positions mm. perhaps will have stronger views but it does seem that a lot of the problems that other universities have had have been located in the students unions yeah. and I think I don't want to downplay the issue uh, nationwide or even worldwide or at least in the West but I do get the feeling and certainly through my experience of running this this organization the problem is found in pockets Mm. And it's not, it's not spread particularly thickly. But the the minority can have a 
a real big effect. Mm. Um, and if there are enough people who aren't too fussed about standing up for arguably the, the supreme value of our yeah. culture, then it, it can quite quickly find itself dying away. And that's, going back to your first question, that's another reason I think that I wanted to do something like this. I, I, I've never been particularly interested in getting, even joining societies, never mind setting one up. But uh, you hear all the time that if there's something that's kind of worth mm. fighting for or even dying for, I, I think back to the, the Charlie Hebdo mm. massacre and you got all of this, mm. all, of, all, all of these cartoons talking about the pen's mighty than the sword and a lot of, a lot of verbal commitment to the idea without necessarily any strong action and to back follow it up. Through. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, and maybe there was a sense that I'd been one of those people a little bit as well. I'd been interested in this for a long time, but had never really mm. done anything meaningful mm. other than rant a little bit to my friends or what have you. Mm. And so perhaps that irked me and I thought, well, if you have the idea, you might as well see what you can do. Yes. Um, and I don't want to elevate this society way above its station. This isn't... Well, this no, wait a minute. You were reported in the Times. Oh, that's so, true. So, come uh, on. Sunday Times. Uh, uh, Sunday Times. Uh, right. Well, that's, um, that's, that's, that's maybe it was good. the Times. I can't remember. <laughs> it's, it's, that's, that's good going. Um, I'm very interested in what you say there because uh, about, about this thing of n no follow through. You, know, you mentioned Charlie Hebdo. And I think after Charlie Hebdo, there was this huge demonstration through Paris and all the leaders, world mm -hmm. leaders, political leaders, joining all, arms, all mm -hmm. joining arms, move, move me along where we are, just with Charlie Hebdo, oh, yeah. and then nothing no. you know, after that. Um, there's also this phenomenon, isn't there, of I'm in favour of free speech, but, you yes. know, this has become the cliche, I'm in favour, and then you think, oh, here comes the but. It, yeah. You know what I mean, though, don't you? It's, the but is almost always guaranteed. Yes. Um, I just, I think it's something that people say without really thinking. Mm. what it even means mm. um, it's some you, you can't come out really and say I'm not in favor of free speech so it, you pay lip service to the principle without having any mm. any idea what it what it really means um, and perhaps more saliently without any idea of what it means to lose it mm. or what a failure to commit to the principle can lead to in a society when you uh, started this as well, I mean, you know, was it, uh, is your particular uh, um, approach a political one? I mean, are you a, are you a political animal? You know, have, were you interested in politics before you say you were interested in, in free speech and you mm -hmm. want to do something and you felt strongly about that? Were you political at all? I wouldn't say I've had any particularly strong affiliation. Certainly, party politics no. hasn't been hasn't been no. something that's gripped me. No. Um, not to say that that wouldn't be something that I could get interested in with the with the right party, if you mm. like. But um, no, for me, it's it's a, it's I think it's above all of that in a way. This this transcends politics, mm. uh, and you can see that if you look at the range of people that have found themselves on the wrong end of this. Mm. Um, well, just an exa as, as, as an example, our first two speakers, Peter Hitchens, everybody will acknowledge as conservative writer, mm. speaker, and our second was Claire Fox, mm -hmm. who's most certainly of the left. And both of these people have found themselves in the same position, and ironically have found themselves now on, on the same side. Mm. And I think if you, if you forget that this is something that's beyond all of this, you'll, you'll fall into the trap, which I think a lot of the media has of associating free speech with a particular political wing. And now it's seen strangely to be a, a, a right wing phenomenon. Somehow. I was going to ask you that very thing. It's yeah. sort of like the people who are sort of standing up for it, or, or for that matter, I mean, there's something else, for example, uh, Toby Young, for example, mm, is about oh. to start something called the Free Speech Union. He's going to be coming on this, this show. Right. But there is therefore this perception that this, these are broadly centre-right people who are mm. making a fuss about free speech. You, that's, you said that's not justified, that, that view. Perhaps most of the people speaking out on this are from that side yeah. of the political spectrum. But that doesn't mean that 
if you took, I don't know, a scan of the country, that the only people who, or the mid, most people who care about this suffer, are the right. And of course, historically, most of these battles that were fought were from the left. Yes. The kind of anti-establishment. Mm. I'm thinking of Berkeley, California, that kind of thing. Um, everything shifted. This is where this, <laughs> this is where this clown world meme you may have heard of has come, uh, has arisen from this idea that we're living now in a universe which is just flipped upside down and yes. everything that we used to that we used to think is no longer true and almost anything goes but i think it's concerning that people are branding this right wing partly because <laughs> right wing has in our culture uh, negative connotations which i don't think it should but uh that's where we're at and so positioning it in this way immediately gets people's backs up, I think. Um, but there is, you know, you could make the point, surely, that so much of the incentive of, of, of basically no platforming people and actually trying to stop people talking has actually come from the left. I mean, this is the reality of it, you know, that it's actually broadly conservative or centre-right views, call it what you want, those, those are the ones that they disagree with and they want to get shut down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the reality of it. Well, that's what's happening. Certainly in universities, you have mm. predominantly left-wing students' unions, um, left-wing protests that are usually, more often than not, affecting right-wing speakers. But mm. Jermaine Greer was disinvited. Mm -hmm. she, she's not right-wing. No, no. Um, it's Julie Bindle again. Julie Bindle. Well. This isn't... It's difficult to pinpoint exactly what the, ma the master values are in all of this. Douglas Murray's recent book tries mm. to tease some of this apart. Mm. I think he does a really good job. And certainly, if anybody's interested in having a look at the history of, of a lot of this, he, he exposes much of that um, and shows the origins are very much political. Um, but, but yeah, I think, it's, I think it would be risky to, in the same way that it's risky, to associate commitment to free speech with purely right wing mm. thought. I think it would also be risky to put suppression of spe free speech purely on the left. Mm. I, think, I think it's probably got to be assessed on a more individual basis and that's where we have to, to look at it. So. You mentioned something about this a bit earlier, but what worries me actually, James, really is that you know, you get the, uh, I believe in free speech, but people, mm -hmm. right? You got those. Um, and we know where they're coming from. But it, it worries me that actually there is now a group of people, a significant group of people who actually do not believe yeah. in free speech. Yeah. I mean, that not that they, we say they will say, I think they don't, they might not actually say it that way, but, but they do not believe in it as a principle. You know, you were saying this is something which finally mm -hmm. made you want to do something because it's so important. Do you think that's true? Well, I, I, did, I did mention earlier that it's very unusual to hear anyone publicly say, I don't believe in free speech. But I have actually come across people in the course of my running the society who've come, I, one person springs to mind who actually came to the society's fair and said, oh, I don't, I don't know, I don't agree with free speech. Mm. And I said, oh, brilliant, come, come to our events and we can have a discussion. Yeah, and yeah. he said something like, I'm entitled to my opinion. I said, hang on mate, that, that's free speech right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're missing the yeah. point. But sometimes people don't want to be reasoned with. Um, and in that moment, we don't want to get into, a, mm. into an argument with the fella. But uh, it's, it's awfully odd to see how the, how the cogs fit together in that line of thinking. I don't, somewhere down the line, you're gonna find yourself struggling. Yeah, but what do, what, is, what do you think is the basis for what they're saying? I mean, what, how would they explain their position? Right, that's, that's a massive question. Um, and I think that there are lots of answers, but more often than not, I think it's actually perversely well-meaning. Right. Um, bear with me, perhaps, yeah, but yeah. I think you hear it a lot, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think people want to be nice. Um, they don't want people's feelings hurt. They don't want, certainly don't want to be seen as somebody 
who is defending people's feelings being hurt. And if they have, for whatever reason, managed to associate a commitment to free speech with a commitment to that, mm. I can totally see how you might find yourself being averse to it. But it's more, for me, as so many things are, an issue w around, or an issue centered on just a lack of understanding mm. of what somebody means by free speech. And as it happens, I think, even the people who claim to be very committed to that philosophically, when they're actually pushed to define what they mean by free speech, that's a difficult thing. And I would say that I fall into that category myself in that mm. the but in a way sometimes always follows because unless you really are calling yourself an absolutist free speech advocate in which anything goes. And this brings us back to Claire Fox because she got in hot, the hot water I mentioned was due to mentioning on, I believe, a radio program um, that she may well be in favor of child pornography. Mm. Now that's not to say that she's pro child pornography for mm. goodness sake. But what she's saying is that if you're going to say I'm pro free speech, and I'm an absolutist, mm. you're going to have to follow through and commit to that. Mm. Um, I'm sure she'll hate the fact that I've mentioned that, mm. but it's just a really good touchstone to see how very quickly, if you hold on to this strongly, you're going you're gonna to find yourself defending things you maybe wish you weren't defending. Um, on the basis that it's free speech, not yeah. that you agree with it. It's exactly, which is, of course, is it, the, yeah. is it Voltaire? Yes, exactly. I'd defend to yeah. the death. Or even more recently, Christopher Hitchens, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to have free speech, it means, you know, people saying things you don't want to hear. Yeah. Right. But I mean, the interesting thing is when you talk about the fellow who came along to your society or the people we're talking about broadly who don't really believe in it, it's largely on the basis of um, offence being given, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Which is not quite the same as... Not, but not agreeing with something. You're saying they don't want to be, of, they don't want to be offended, or rather, they they don't. They're taking offence on behalf of groups who are not even there. Yeah. This is the point. Often, you know, the, the, isn't this the point that really that it's it's about the giving of offence as opposed mm -hmm. to I don't agree with you on this point, so I'm going to stop you talking. Yeah, the, the psychologist. Jonathan Haidt, whose work I'm sure you're familiar with. Oh, right, yeah. He, um, this is the, uh, Jonathan Haidt did The Righteous Mind, the book. Yeah, the that's right. Mind, and yeah. also The Coddling of the American Mind, yeah. I believe, after that. Mm -hmm. uh, he works out of a university in New York. Uh, these things are actually in the business school there. Mm. But his thesis, narrowed down, I suppose, is that a lot of this comes from parenting in the early years, which has become overbearing. Again, from, from a position of, it's a well-intended position. Um, they, they don't want their children to find themselves hurt, um, whether that's physically or mentally. But what he has, in the course of his research, what he's discovered is that children are less and less often these days left on their own mm -hmm. to reason with each other. And that sort of thing is crucial for your development and your understanding of how to simply deal with disagreement. Mm -hmm. If you're always able to call upon an authority figure, in this case, a parent in, in university, the student's union, or the, the dean or whatever, if you're always able to do that, and you, you, you're, that's your first port of call, you'll never learn to deal with offence because there's always somebody who can come and tell the other person not to do it. Mm. And again, I wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to put all of this on that one factor, but I certainly think that's playing a role that, that children aren't growing up to be as independent as they used to be. And therefore maybe more rigid, you know, mm -hmm. mentally more rigid. I mean, mm -hmm. it, do you think that students, people around student age, young people around the student age, do you think that they are basically more intolerant now generally? I mean, do you, when I say intolerant, they would say them, see themselves as being hugely tolerant, of course, mm -hmm. but um, I would say just intolerant of anyone who deviates from a particular kind of approach, you know, 
um, if you think of the whole woke culture, right? That is, you know, intolerance writ large, isn't it? You know the new name for those people. What? What is it? They're members of Woko Haram. Woko Haram. Yeah, I <laughs> no, love that one. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Woko Haram. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, I think very often these people would say they're tolerant of everything other than intolerance. Yes. And I mean, maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. But often I think people just haven't been exposed enough to people that are a bit different to them in mm. the way that they think. Mm. And my experience running this group, one of the things we do, perhaps the main focus of the society is to have discussion evenings. Um, so of course we have the external speakers, but they're less frequent than our, um, our more regular mm. discussion evenings. We model those essentially, I suppose, on a, on a tutorial, but it's a, an informal extended one. Mm. It can run beyond two hours of sometimes, um, where everyone just gets around a table, uh, often a very large table, and we, we have a, a focus and we'll just hash out an issue over the course of that time. Often I'll, I'll start by just paring things down a little bit, maybe offer a definition. For example, uh, we've discussed uh, hate speech as a concept, we've discussed absolute free speech, political correctness, just trying to pare these things down, tease them apart, get a feel for what people's intuitions are. And very often you see people you see people, I don't want to say change their minds, but maybe just open their eyes a little yeah. bit, mm -hmm. having their eyes opened uh, by everybody in the group. And that's really good to see. Mm -hmm. So perhaps people are coming with preconceptions that would clash with my own. But then over time, we perhaps find a, a consensus. Um, and then they come back and we do it all again in a couple of weeks time. How big is your society now, by the way? I mean, how many people, you know, do you have membership? Yeah. yeah, so we actually, when we started, we thought the best thing, it seemed perhaps, um, it seemed perhaps right to make it free. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up then taking more signups than anybody ever has in the, at the Societies Fair at the University. Really? So we were inundated with people signing up. Oh, that's, um, that's great. Yeah, so that was a really good sign. And our first event was very successful, and since then we've kind of maintained that pretty solidly. Uh, the discussion evening seemed to be just as popular as the public events, which is a really good sign. That may be something to do with the fact we provide Krispy Kreme donuts just to, to, to lure them in. <laughs> but. Uh, Works every time. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm surprised they're not. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think, I think we've been s maybe surprised that we've had such a positive reaction, both from the students and from the staff. And I'd really just like to mention the support we've had from Sir Anthony Selden, the Vice Chancellor, mm. who's, who's really been fantastic on all of this. Uh, I've met with him alongside Daria to discuss just the plans for everything. He's mm. He's, um, he's congratulated us on the, the, the success we've had in the early stages, but um, he's also mentioned us in the Sunday Times a couple of Sundays ago um, in an article in which he discussed this problem more broadly. And again, we're bucking the trend at this university, standing up for, for free speech in a way that really I don't see any other mm. universities doing, not at least from top to bottom. Yeah. You, you have, like, as I said, you have other free speech societies in other places. Perhaps you have other pro-free pro free speech vice chancellors and pro-free speech students union, although I'm not, I'm seeing less evidence of that. Yes. But to have it at every stage at Buckingham, I think, is um, that's just really refreshing. Well, all the very best for it, James, you know, going forward. And uh, I think, you know, it is crucial what you're doing. And I hope a lot of people will emulate you. Yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to see, actually. Yeah. Uh, look, I... <laughs> I'd like it to be the case that there's no need for a free speech society anywhere. Mm. And maybe 10 years, 20 years ago, there, there was no need. Um, but at the moment, I think it's just it's a really, really good idea. And at the very least, you have, you have a good time discussion, discussing things with people. 
Thanks very much indeed, James. Thanks. Uh, that's it for so what you're saying is this week. Please remember to subscribe if it's totally free, if you haven't done so already. And we will see you next week. Thank you.